Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, page 243 in the New Testament. An unmarried man is writing about marriage, but few people, if any, have had a higher understanding of marriage than Paul. Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for a husband has authority over his wife, just as Christ has authority over the church. And Christ is himself the saviour of the church, his body, and so wives must submit completely to their husbands, just as the church submits itself to Christ. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making it clean by washing it in water in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other imperfection. Men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hates his own body. Instead, he feeds it and takes care of it just as Christ does the church for we are members of his body. As the scripture says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and the two will become one. There is a deep secret truth revealed in this scripture which I understand as applying to Christ and the church. But it also applies to you. Every husband must love his wife as himself and every wife must respect her husband. Father, as we come to this time when we talk together, we pray that your Spirit will help each one of us to recognize what is human opinion and what is divine truth. And may he also plant in our hearts the knowledge that we cannot escape from divine truth. We can throw out human opinion, but not your word. Pray that you'll give me wisdom as I present this subject and I pray that you'll give us all a relaxed atmosphere in which we are ready to hear not what we think you'll say to us but what you really want to say to us. We pray that something of your love in all its purity may shine through. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. My subject tonight is sex, love, and marriage. And we live in a world that is in almost total confusion as to how these three things relate to each other. We just don't seem able to get them together. And yet somehow deep down we believe they belong together and should go together. Reading again Jimmy Savile's autobiography, I realize that he is not only a spokesman, for our age, but a symbol of a whole generation that cannot get it together. He describes many experiences of sex. He boasts of casual conquests, even in a train corridor in broad daylight. But I notice that when he's describing girls, he never uses any language of love. The love in his life was reserved for his mother, to whom he gave the honorary title of the Duchess. And when he spoke of her, expressions of love came in. And marriage, well, there is no marriage in Jimmy Savile's life. He's just never got it together. And he is so much an expression of the generation in which we live that I think that's a good place to start. What has caused such confusion that many young people believe in their hearts that marriage is an actual hindrance to love. Following a recent wedding in this building, my wife and I ran a young man who was a friend of the best men to the local station, and we chatted about many things, and just before we got to the station and dropped him off, I said, uh, are you likely to have the wedding bells ringing for you in the near future? and was astonished to get a strong reply, no fear. And a little further 
conversation revealed that he had seen so many marriages break down and break up that he was quite determined not to get entangled in it, in it himself. I hadn't time to ask him what he was going to do about sex or love, but he was again typical of many who are desperately afraid of this lifetime involvement between two people, which we call marriage. Now, why has the confusion come? One is that the concept of romantic love as the foundation of marriage has swept through our Western world and been fostered by the big and small screen. I'm going to read something that I think will relax you a bit, but listen carefully. It's a description of marriage based on romantic love. The confusion begins when boy meets girl and the entire sky lights up in romantic profusion. Smoke and fire are followed by lightning and thunder, and alas, two trembly-voiced adolescents find themselves knee-deep in true love. Adrenaline and 64 other hormones are dumped into the cardiovascular system by the pint, and every nerve is charged with electricity. Then two little fellows go racing up the respective backbones and blast their exhilarating message into each spinning head. This is it. The search is over. You've found the perfect human being. Hooray for love. For our romantic young couple, it is simply too wonderful to behold. They want to be together 24 hours a day, to take walks in the rain and sit by the fire and kiss and munch and cuddle. They get all choked up just thinking about each other, and it doesn't take long for the subject of marriage to arise. So they set the date and reserve the church and contact the minister and order the flowers. That's usually the order, by the way. <laughs> the big day arrives amidst mother's tears and dad's grins and jealous bridesmaids and bratty little flower girls. The candles are lit and two beautiful songs are butchered by the bride's sister. <laughs> then the vows are muttered and the rings are placed on trembling fingers and the minister tells the groom to kiss his new wife. Then they sprint up the aisle, each flashing 32 teeth, on the way to the reception. Their friends and well-wishers hug and kiss the bride and roll their eyes at the groom and eat the awful cake and follow the instructions of the perspiring photographer. Finally, the new Mr. and Mrs. run from the church in a flurry of confetti and strike out on their honeymoon. So far, the beautiful dream remains intact, but it is living on borrowed time. The first night in the hotel is not only less exciting than advertised, it turns into a comical disaster. About three o'clock on the second afternoon, he gives ten minutes serious thought to the fateful question, have I made an enormous mistake? His silence increases her anxiety and the seeds of disenchantment are sown. Each partner has far too much time to think about the consequences of this new relationship and they both begin to feel trapped. Their initial argument is a silly thing. They struggle over how much money to spend for dinner on the third night of honeymoon. She wants to go to some place romantic to charge up the atmosphere and he wants to eat at Wimpy's. <laughs> the flare-up only lasts a few minutes and is followed by apologies but some harsh words have been exchanged which took the keen edge off the beautiful dream. They will soon learn to hurt each other much more effectively. Somehow they make it through the six-day trip and drive home to set up house together. Then the world starts to splinter and disintegrate before their eyes. The next fight is bigger and better than the first. He leaves home for two hours and she calls her mother. Throughout the first year, they will be engaged in an enormous contest of wills, each vying for power and leadership, and in the midst of this tug of war, she staggers out of the obstetrician's office with the words ringing in her ears, I have some good news for you, Mrs. Jones. If there is anything on earth Mrs. Jones doesn't need at that time, it's good news from the obstetrician. <laughs> from there to the final conflict, we see two disappointed, confused, and deeply hurt young people wondering how it all came about. We also see a little lad who will never enjoy the benefits of a stable home. He'll be raised by his mother and will always wonder, why doesn't Dad live here anymore? wonder why you stopped laughing about three-quarters of the way through. 
That's one thing that's caused the confusion, that it is romance that is the foundation of marriage. The second thing is that erotic love has replaced romantic love as the basis for marriage. Some enchanted evening has given way to Saturday night fever, which is a very different kind of thing. Instead of the emphasis on the emotional, there is now the emphasis on the physical. I said earlier in the service you should study the lyrics of some of the tops of the pops. It is quite incredible, the understanding of love that comes through. Here are some song titles over the last few years. Before the dance was through, I knew I was in love with you. It's not even good poetry. And here's a man who's starting from utter confusion. I didn't know just what to do, so I whispered, I love you. <laughs> and here is a classic example of the beginnings of a permanent relationship. Hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? <laughs> Cliff Richard in that film, uh, which the Billy Graham Association produced, sang a song typical of this concept, and it was entitled... I will love you forever today. Well, you're not going to make a supersonic man or woman out of them, even though you are having a good time and you don't want to stop. Most of these songs appear to be in love with love. Or is love the wrong word? Certainly in that context, sex and marriage are drifting steadily apart. And the trends are obvious. One trend, for example, that there are now fewer marriages in church than in registry office. From one point of view, I'm rather glad about that because I'm fed up with the hypocrisy of couples going to church to be married who don't know the God before whom they stand or the Jesus in whom they, whose name they're married. And I'd prefer the continental system whereby every couple goes to the registry office first and then goes to a church for God's blessing. I think it would clear a lot of debris out. I said to a vicar two weeks ago, do you get many marriages because you're the parish priest? He said, very few. I said, that's strange. Why don't they come to you? He said, the church is a modern building and not photogenic enough. They all go to the Gothic one in the next parish. But that trend is dying. And in 1977, for the first time in recent history, there were more marriages in the registry office largely because there were so many second and third and even fourth and fifth attempts to find the perfect partner. But a, th a second trend is even more serious, and that is that more and more people are not getting married at all. It's just a piece of paper. The main thing is that we should love each other. Why go through a ceremony and go through all the kerfuffle of a reception? We love each other, we want to live together, and even the tax laws favor us, in living singly together rather than getting married. So why not? And that's a question we're going to address ourselves to. Many alternatives are springing up. Communal marriage, more popularly known as wife swapping. Trial marriage, in which you say to someone, we'll live together for two or three years, and if it doesn't work out, we'll change partners. Homosexual marriage has certainly come on the scene, though not greatly in this country yet. Two men can get married now in America, or two women. But the most common form is simply cohabitation, moving in together. Almost certainly, those who accept what the Bible says about marriage are now in a small minority in this country, and we've got to face that fact and situation. Yet it's logical that if God made sex and made us capable of sex, love, and marriage, that this book somewhere would contain within it the maker's instructions as to how to get the best out of it. And sure enough, he starts on almost the first page, certainly in the first chapter, there are his first clear directions as to how he intended this gift of his to be used. In the very first two chapters of the Bible, the two purposes for which he gave sex, are clearly outlined. Purpose number one, he made man male and female for companionship, for partnership, that they might complete each other, help each other, share each other's life. And I want you to notice that when he said that to them, that was the first thing he said about marriage. 
and there was no mention of children anywhere in that text. In other words, marriage is first of all for partnership between the parents. That has a very great bearing on the question of contraception, but I'm not going to stay on that one now. But sex is first of all to express love. But the second purpose comes, funnily enough, in chapter 1. first purpose comes in chapter 2 and the second in chapter 1. But in fact, chapter 2 is a recap and goes back before the word of chapter 1. But in chapter 1, after he has said, you're to be helpmeets, you're to be partners, he then blessed them and said, now multiply, fill the earth and rule it. This was an additional blessing to the partnership he was giving them. Children are a blessing from the Lord, but they're an additional blessing. The first purpose of marriage is partnership, and therefore a partnership that doesn't have children, even though they may want to, is still a marriage in God's sight and a full marriage. The partnership is the primary purpose and the parent of the second one. It's amazing how many of the basic essentials were missing from the first wedding. There was no best man. There were no bridesmaids, there was no confetti, there was no reception to pay for. None of the things that get us all excited and worried and anxious. No hairdresser to go to before the ceremony. All these little details. In fact, I would give a plea to young people who will get married. Will you please have a simpler wedding than society presses on you? There seems to be a race up the ladder to have the best and most elaborate wedding anybody's ever had. And it's a vicious ladder to get onto. I'm sure the Lord sees something very wrong in this. And what he sees wrong in it is that for about five months before the wedding, the couple are so bogged down in the details of the wedding that they are not getting ready for the marriage. And the wedding lasts 40 minutes and the marriage lasts 40 years. It seems out of all proportion. Well, let's take just one verse from Scripture which is in the Old Testament and the New Testament which is the only statement on marriage repeated four times in the Bible and it is repeated in such different situations as the Garden of Eden and the Roman Empire and clearly is one sentence which is basic to marriage through all the ages and through all the countries. Let's look at the basic essentials of marriage and ask the question, what makes a marriage a marriage? I'm frequently asked that question now in schools and in young people's groups. When is a marriage not a marriage? What actually makes people married in God's sight? Or putting it another way, the text that says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. How do you know when God has joined somebody together? Have they to have a flash of revelation from heaven saying, this is it, as Adam said when Eve was presented to him. That first marriage must have been quite a shock. He had to have a general anesthetic beforehand. <laughs> well now, from this one statement applied to all mankind, not just Jews and Christians, made by Jesus himself and Paul, but originating in Genesis chapter 2, we can get the basic essentials of marriage. And there are three. Listen carefully. Therefore a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now that statement tells us a whole lot of things about the basic facts of marriage. First it tells us that God's pattern for marriage is monogamy. One man marrying one woman for life. I love the schoolboy howler who said who wrote down monotony as being married to the same person for the rest of your life. <laughs> the word is monogamy. Now that rules out, for example, polyandry, which is one woman having more than one husband. Believe me, that state does apply in at least one tribe in the Sahara Desert. There may be others for all I know. It's not a very common custom. And in that tribe, which is matriarchal, the wife bosses the husband or the husband's. It also precludes polygamy, which is one man having many wives. Now, there are two forms of polygamy, one of which is becoming very common in this country, the other of which is not. The one that isn't is what we call simultaneous polygamy, in which one man 
has a number of wives at the same time and spends perhaps one night with one and the next night with another and the next night with a third. There are certain Mormon families still practicing this in Salt Lake City and there are certainly tribes in Africa practicing it. But what we have not woken up to is that polygamy is now rife in England in its other form. The other form is successive polygamy in which you marry one wife after another after another. Instead of spending one night with each, you spend five years with this one, seven years with this one, two years with this one. It is polygamy just the same, for polygamy means having more than one partner alive. And successive polygamy, for that's what it is, and we should call it that, is now spreading very rapidly indeed into our country. You know that one marriage in three ends in divorce. Well, we also know that nine divorces out of ten end in remarriage. So polygamy is on us. The only difference between simultaneous and successive polygamy is the length of time spent with each. Now the Old Testament shows that this concept of monogamy took a long time to sink in. And indeed there are stories in the Old Testament of men in the people of God and great men of faith who were polygamists. Abraham was though I just pause to note that if Abraham had stuck to sexual relations with his wife only, the treaty to be signed in washing tomorrow would never have been needed, right? For all the troubles in the Middle East came from just one wrong act in this area by Abraham. And all the Arabs came from Ishmael and all the Israelis came from Isaac and only closely related people can hate each other that much. And another was Solomon, supposed to be wise, and as regards other people's problems, he was very sensible. As regards his own, he seems to have been a fool, a man who could have 300 wives and 700 concubines, was just a man whose hope triumphed over experience time and time again. So you thought you had problems. But I just note again that when Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel was split into ten tribes and two over civil war, and they have never since in the last 3,000 years managed to get together again as one nation. And it is from Solomon that that began. Moses himself made a concession to human weakness by allowing successive polygamy or what we normally call divorce. And he, he made that concession under God's guidance and Jesus later said it was a concession because the human heart was hard. It was a limited concession that if a man married a woman and found something offensive or repulsive in her, particularly physically, that he could write out a bill of divorce and send her away. Another man was then free to marry her and the man who'd sent her away was free to remarry. But into that limited exception, people began to squeeze so many other exceptions that by the time Jesus came, you could divorce your wife for burning your breakfast, for talking too loud in the street, or for gossiping with neighbors. And that was regarded as offensive and repulsive enough to divorce. And when Jesus came on the scene, there were two schools of thought. There were many divorces in Israel at that time. But there was a strict school of teaching led by the rabbi, rabbi Shammai. And he said, divorce on the grounds of adultery only. And then there was Rabbi Hillel. And he said, divorce your wife for burning your breakfast, for gossiping in the street, and so on. You can guess which rabbi had the larger congregation. And they came to Jesus with this very hot potato and said, now which? Which do you, line do you take? And he stepped right over onto Shammai's side and he said, I take the strict view, adultery only. Now let's get back to Genesis 2.24. I want to talk about the eternal triangle, not the husband, wife and the other woman, but the eternal triangle of the three forces or factors which together make a solid foundation for marriage. Somebody's called it a three-legged stool, and if any stool is missing, then the stool collapses. Here they are in that verse. Leave, cleave, one flesh. 
These are the three elements in marriage. Let me give them to you in another form. First, the element of social responsibility. Second, the element of personal commitment. And third, the element of physical union. These three things constitute a marriage in God's sight and the three legs of a marriage that will stand. Let's take the first. A man will leave his father and mother. I'm very struck by the fact that that was said in the context of the Garden of Eden. Eve had no mother, which meant, as Richard Stilgo pointed out this week, that Adam had no mother-in-law. But there were no parents. Yet right from the beginning, here is a recognition that when a marriage is taking place, other people are involved besides the couple. Now when you begin to get into wedding arrangements, and we had six weeks to make ours, and my wife had to do most of them, I was away in the RAF. We were suddenly flooded with all that had to be done, and there came a number of points where we felt, oh, if we could only just run off to Gretna Green and get it over with. But it is very important to realize that marriage affects other people. It is not just a couple in love, but a couple in law as well. And there are going to be relationships in law as well as in love. Why? I'll tell you why. Because when a couple come together to become one, they are breaking another basic unit of society. The basic building brick which builds up society and makes it stable and strong is the family. And when two people get coupled up together, they are breaking one of those bricks. They are leaving mother and father. It is therefore in society's interests to make sure that they will build an equally strong unit so that society may continue to be stable. That is why society has an interest in marriage. That is why they are legalized. Because if we just go and form whatever couples we like, whenever we like, society will disintegrate and innocent children and grandchildren will be the ones who will suffer. You are breaking up a family. You leave your father and mother. You're breaking that thing up only in order that you may build something equally strong. But the sad feature of our day is that what is being built by the next generation is not as strong as those units which were built by their parents or as strong as those built by their grandparents. So you can see there is a social responsibility in marriage. You're coming together to form a stable unit, a brick from which future society will be built. And you have a responsibility to do that and to let other people see that it's done and to make public your intentions and to make legal your responsibilities so that that which has been broken may be replaced by something equally strong. Now that's the first very important element in true marriage, social responsibility. But there is a widespread reaction to this kind of involvement and commitment, as if young people are saying, no, that's too much to ask. It will bind me, it will tie me down. I don't know what I want to be doing next year. I don't know what, who I want to be with. I don't know who will be top of the charts in my relationships. A decade from now, I'm not going to be tied down. And insofar as they say that and leave home, they are breaking up a home and they are not replacing it with a stable home. And that is affecting the whole community. Now the second element in this text is personal commitment. I get that from the word cleave. I wish we could get back to the original meaning. So often cleave, cleavage, cleft, cloven means divide. To split apart, to chop apart. But the original meaning of the word cleave, and both meanings are still in the Oxford Dictionary, the original meaning of the word cleave means to hold together. And in fact the Hebrew word translated cleave is the word glue. And so God is saying in Genesis 2, a man will leave his father and mother and be glued to his wife. Now there are many implications of that. If you stick two pieces of paper together, glue them together, and then try and tear them apart, you will not tear the glue, you will tear the paper. 
And that indeed is what happens when a couple are torn apart. It's the people who are torn. Not the marriage, but the people. Well, now here we touch on a very basic question. What is true love? Well, we've almost answered it with that word glue. Fundamental to the Bible concept of love is that it's something that is within your control. Therefore, it can be commanded, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Well, now, you can't command things that are beyond your control. And the way we talk about love so often is if we're completely helpless victims of it. We, we fell into it like falling into a ditch and we couldn't help it. But the love that the Bible talks about is a love that you can control and can therefore be commanded and can therefore be promised. And in the marriage service, it is promised. Now, you cannot promise to maintain romantic love for the rest of your life. You cannot promise to maintain erotic love for the rest of your life. But you can promise to love and to cherish for the rest of your life. Because this love is something different. It is not something of the head or even something of the heart. It is something of the will. And therefore you are asked in the wedding service, will you promise to love and to cherish till death parts you? And the answer is, I will. A cynic has said that is the longest sentence in the English language. Well, it may be. But it's a promise, I will do this. Now, you couldn't say that with romantic love. You couldn't say that with erotic love. But you can say it with true love because true love is modeled on God's love for us. And God's love for us is based on his will toward us. It is something he decides. And love is a voluntary, conscious, deliberate decision to stay together. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Till death parts us. And it's a decision that is made and therefore can be kept. Unless there is this kind of commitment, love cannot be fully personal. It ceases to be personal and people become objects to be used and not subjects to be known. They become things rather than people. They become means and not ends. Maybe this word love itself is misleading. The content certainly is. The Greeks used to have different words for different kinds of love. They had eros for what we call lust. They had philia for what we call affection. And they had this lovely word agape, which meant the love that is centered in the will, that captures the thoughts and the feelings and brings them into line with the will and cares for someone. Even if there's something you don't like in that person, love goes on loving until you like. That's something you don't like. That's a love that is decisive, that is true. And thank God that's the kind of love that God has for me. That's the only security I have in knowing that God won't fall out of love with me. Because he never fell in love with me. You see what I'm saying? He didn't look down and say, oh, John David Paul's my heart miss, misses a beat. You know, I, I, just, I just fallen for him. He's great. God knew too much about me to fall in love with me. But God says, I love that man and nobody will stop me. That's his love. And it's that kind of love that's going to hold a marriage together. When somebody says to me, look, we just don't love each other anymore, I want to take that word don't and say, are you telling me you can't love them anymore or you won't? Because if you're talking about true love, if you're honest, you'll have to say, I won't love him anymore. It's not that you can't, it is that you won't, if this is the kind of love we're talking about. Because it's something that you can do, even if your love is thrown back in your face, even if you're spat on, even if you're treated abominably. I think of a story I heard of a man in the north of England, in Sheffield, whose wife, shortly after their marriage, began to play about with other men. And it wasn't long before she got into real trouble. And she lost her love for her husband, her romantic love for her husband. And his friend said, why don't you divorce her? She doesn't care that much for you. She's not going to come back to you. She's got far too many other men. Well, she came back to him. Then she would go after someone else. Then she'd come back. Then she'd go after someone, someone else. And so it went on. 
His friend said, look, you're crazy to stay on in that relationship. And he turned round on them with anger and he said, never speak to me like that about my wife. She's my wife and I shall love her as long as there's breath in her body. And he did and she died some years later of the way of life that she'd chosen. And his hands were spread over her in love and prayer as she died. That's true love. And that's the kind of love that God has. The kind of love that Jesus had when having loved his own, he loved them to the end. They denied him, they'd run away from him. But thank goodness Jesus hadn't fallen in love with Peter, James and John. But he really loved them. So he stayed on. It may be right at this point to underline that this is why God hates divorce. It's why he hates it. You can read that in Malachi 2. The context is, he says, you're breaking a covenant of love with the wife of your youth. That's why I hate it. It's so contrary to true love. It can't have been true love in the first place if you can get to this. Did you really commit yourself as an act of will to stay with this person for better or for worse? Or was it just, if it works out, we'll stick together? And so God hates divorce. The Old Testament, I've told you, allows it for certain things as a concession. The New Testament allows divorce for only two purposes, physical infidelity. If one partner breaks the one flesh relationship, then the other may divorce. It doesn't say the other must. The first thing to try is forgiveness. The other ground is spiritual incompatibility. But I want you to notice, very important, it is the unbeliever who must take the initiative in that situation. That narrows the Christian right down to only one situation in which he can take the initiative. Divorce is an experience that is worse than experiencing bereavement because the marriage is dead but the partner is still alive and that is more difficult to bear than a straight bereavement. I've told you if you tear glued paper apart you tear the paper but with any children involved it's like taking a saw and sawing them in two. Marriage breakdown is clearly one of the greatest tragedies in human society. True love, on the other hand, talks like this. Do you remember Fiddler on the Roof? And do you remember Golda and Tevi when Tevi says, Do you love me? Do you remember that little song? At the end of the song, Golda replies, For 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? <laughs> I like that. If that's not love, what is? For 25 years, I've stuck it. If that's not love, what is? Now, she's much, much nearer a Bible understanding of true love than those who say, I'm in love with you today because I fell asleep with you in my mind last night. Well, let's move on to the third leg of the stool, the third fundamental and essential item in true marriage. One plus one equals one. We finally got around to sex. And that's the way we should get around to it, finally. That's the order in the Bible. It is the last thing mentioned in this verse. The social responsibility and the personal commitment are established in that verse before the physical union. And that is God's unchanging order for marriage. Now this is a vital ingredient for partnership, never mind parenthood. And it was made this way before man fell into sin, therefore to say that sex equals sin is utterly wrong. It is also quite wrong, as we've seen, to say that sex equals love, and to talk about sex as making love is rubbish. Sex doesn't make love, love makes sex. That's God's teaching. Sex is not the essence of love, but it is the expression of it, and therefore a wonderful reinforcement of it. And within the context of accepting social responsibility and personal commitment, 
sex is constantly reinforcing that relationship. But outside those two things, it becomes destructive and counterproductive and makes relationships sour. And one can understand why. Now that sex is fun, as Larry Christensen says in his book on the Christian family, is God intended. And I greatly warmed to his book when I read that on the second page. I thought, well, that's a man I could go on reading. Interesting that this physical union used to be called the consummation of the marriage. We don't often hear that term now except in law courts. And I looked up the meaning in the Oxford Dictionary and found that it means to put the finishing touch to something. That's a lovely definition. That physical union is to put the finishing touch to accepting the social responsibility and making the personal commitment. It crowns it, to use the other meaning of this word, consummate. And I read part of the book of the Song of Solomon because here we have right in the middle of the Bible a lovely erotic love song within the concept of a marriage in which there is social responsibility and personal commitment. But remember Solomon... I'm afraid by the time he wrote this song, he already had 60 queens and 80 concubines. But of the girl to whom he was singing in the Song of Solomon, he said, there may be 60 queens and there may be 80 concubines, but you, my perfect one, are unique. And the tragedy is that he hadn't waited for the perfect one. Now this physical appetite, which we have, and all of us have it, we become very much aware of it in our teens, is different from other physical appetites. Let's get that quite clear if we're going to understand what I'm going to say next. It is not like the appetites of eating and drinking. Some people say that having sex together is no more than having a hamburger together. It's more fun together. Well, let's look at this. Eating and drinking are physical appetites which we need to satisfy to live. But sex is not. It's quite a different appetite. You can live without satisfying it. But there's something even more. If I eat a hamburger, my mouth is involved and my tummy is involved and my hands are involved, but I am not. The physical act of sex is quite unique in this, that the whole of me is involved. That doesn't apply to anything else we do with our body. In taking the most intimate part and giving it totally to someone else, I give myself. And that is why the first experience of sex you have in life will change your life for the rest of life. You can never be the same person again. Jimmy Savile, talking of his casual conquest, says this. He simply describes them in these terms. He says, if a girl fancies me and wants to give me her all, why should I refuse? Now notice that phrase, wants to give me her all. He doesn't say wants to give me this part, but her all. And herein lies the key to an understanding of what this gift of God is and how it's meant to be used. It is a physical act in which you give your all. There is nothing more to give. And the tragedy is that many arrive on their wedding night and they haven't got all to give. The one wedding present their partner would love to have, they cannot give. It has already been spent. And that, if for no other reason, would be a ground for pleading that the standard of Christian marriage be the biblical one of marriage between virgins. Let's ask the question, what's wrong with sex before marriage? I was asked the other day in the grammar school locally. The boy was quite, quite sincere. But it's interesting that these questions are becoming more and more frequent. I just wish they would ask what's right with it because then they'd find there's no answer. But they always put it on a defensive way, what's wrong with it? Well, what is wrong? I'm intrigued with the euphemisms that are often used instead of calling things by their proper names. Sleeping together. I'm not worried about youngsters sleeping together. It's what they do when they're awake that is far more important. Then there's the euphemism making love. 
well, we're going to see that it may well break it. But when somebody asks me, I have to ask myself, I wonder what argument would appeal to this person. I wonder what ground there is in their thinking or experience on which I could build an answer. Because I know perfectly well when they say what's wrong with it, they're on the defensive. And I've got to find some ground behind those defenses on which I can build the answer. It's not so easy. Here is a rather malicious limerick. There was a young lady named Wilde who kept herself quite undefiled by thinking of Jesus and social diseases and the fear of having a child. That's a vicious little verse, isn't it? Well, of the three motives that this girl was having to keep herself pure, two have vanished in spite of the alarming facts of the increase of venereal disease, there is a widespread idea that a few injections and social diseases are dealt with. They're not. It's on the increase. And then when it comes to the fear of having a child, well, there's the pill before and abortion clinic after. So that fear is gone which leaves only the motive of thinking of Jesus. And if people don't believe in Jesus, then that's gone. And that explains why the three main reasons why people did not have sex before marriage have gone. Well, what arguments can be used? There are three, and I would use one of these three, or two, or even all, depending on who I was talking to. The first argument I would use is the effect on relationships, especially on the girl. Here are some rather sad quotes. Here's a girl who said, When I gave him all, for me it was the beginning, but for him it was the end. And she was not the first to discover that a young man loses interest quickly in a conquered fortress. And that if she really wants to prove his love, or to prove her love, she'll use the best contraceptive in the world. It is completely foolproof. It is the little word, no. Now, it's not a test of true love, even if he says so, nor does true love follow automatically. In fact, psychologically, it tends to make love blind. And as soon as sex has been entered into before marriage, it seems as if a curtain comes down and that becomes the main reason for meeting rather than getting to know each other and preparing for marriage. It takes over what should be in courtship. And that is why many relationships have been broken, not strengthened, by taking this step before the other two. Somebody has said that every girl should write a letter to her boyfriend in these terms, go slowly, my boyfriend, and you will see all that is in me. Or go fast, and I will see how little there is in you. The second argument I would use is the effect on society. Eighty-eight civilizations have crumbled in human history, and someone has examined them to see why these civilizations rose and fell, and the answer is the same every time. In the early years when they were rising, families were strong, marriages were permanent. In the end when they were declining, marriages were breaking up, divorces were frequent, and sexual permissiveness was rife. Now that is the pattern for every one of 88 civilizations, which tells me absolutely clearly that our civilization is on the way out. We are over the top now. We are on the way out as a Western so-called Christian civilization. It's because we've left aside Christian principles. Now the Soviet Union, after the revolution, 1917, said we're finished with Christian standards of sexual behavior. The rule is now free love. It's no more, they said, than taking a drink of water when you're thirsty. You can be married for one day, one week, one month, one year, as long as you like. And it was a, a social disaster area, so much so that they had to alter their laws and now communist countries are much stricter in this area than capitalist countries. I'll tell you something even more serious. The communists realize that the quickest way they can undermine capitalist countries 
is to encourage sex outside marriage. And so they encourage it in the West. Communists encourage it in the West. But they most certainly do not in the East. As I just realized this, I had a picture of a great big boat called Society. And every couple having sex out of marriage were boring a hole in the bottom of the hull. Only a small hole. But there were hundreds doing it. And the ship was sinking. The effect on society should make you pause. You are actually boring a hole in the bottom of it. The third argument I would use for those who had some, some belief in God. And I would say that the argument the Bible uses is not the effect on your relationships, not the effect on society, but its effect on your future. Your future with God. Your future in this world with God and your future in the next world with God. God calls a spade a spade and he calls this fornication and he says quite clearly that this can send a man to hell and rob him of heaven. Even if they, it had no effect on you at all in this life, it could rob you of everlasting happiness in the next unless it's been dealt with and forgiven. That's a very serious thing to say. And you know, God doesn't try and give us all the arguments because that just feeds our self-centeredness. We come and in a cheeky way we say, God, you've got to convince me that it's wrong. You've got to give me enough reasons for my mind, my heart to agree. And God says, I'm not going to give you the reasons. I tell you, you don't come to heaven. But if God takes a strong line like that, you know that he does it because he loves us and because he knows that what he's forbidding is bad for us. God is not a spoil sport. He's not out to spoil our fun or take joy away from us. He's here to give it to us. And he knows that that is going to prevent full happiness occurring. You see, there comes a point when in this area your decision has to be made on one thing, trust, for the simple reason that you will never be able to find out for yourself. Let me spell that out. Here I am, an unmarried person, and I want to know what effect this will have on my marriage and my future. If I do it, I can never know what I've lost. I will never know what I've forfeited. I will never know what my marriage might have been like otherwise. I couldn't. It's at that point that trust is going to be the deciding factor. If parents say to their children, this is wrong because it is bad for you, and God knows that, you've got to trust either God saying it or you've got to trust us saying that God says it. But if you trust someone else, you'll be in the happy position of coming to your marriage with no experience. And that's way, way better than coming with the wrong experience. It boils down ultimately to whether we put our trust in God or someone who's telling us about God. So far I've been talking as if I was discussing promiscuous relationships with anybody and everybody, but this question becomes a very pressing one when a couple are engaged to be married. And there are many who say, well, it may be wrong for others sleeping around, but we fully intend to accept our social responsibility and to be personally committed. We are engaged to be married. Now, engagements are horrible things. They introduce all kinds of artificial pressures from inside you. I think promiscuity is due to external pressures, but within an engagement, internal pressures take over, and they can be very strong. And it is usually the girl who sets the standard. In that area, men are the weaker sex. And you girls can say quite simply to your boys, if we pick the blossom off now, we won't have the fruit later. Well, now what do we say about engaged couples who have every intention of being fully committed? Well, I say two things. Number one, God makes no distinction between fornication, outside engagement or inside engagement. It is the same thing. And when he was looking round for a virgin, to bear his child, he looked for an engaged girl because he knew 
that betrothal in Israel was taken very seriously. It was a legal commitment and yet was still not consummated until the marriage. And if Joseph died during the engagement, she would be a widow. Or if she had sex with someone else, she would be an adulterer, even though they were just betrothed. And Joseph nearly did divorce her when she found he found she was pregnant. But God expected an engaged girl to be a virgin. So he chose Mary. The other thing I would say is this, engagements can be broken. You have not yet fully taken on the responsibility, so you do not have the right. In God's sight, you are stealing something that does not belong to you. I was fascinated reading through the Song of Songs early this morning. Again and again, there was the advice, do not awaken or arouse love. And then that lovely verse came, come, my beloved, and take the delicate things I have stored up for you. Brides have bottom drawers, and in it they put their trousseau and their going away clothes and their white wedding dress. It is far more important that into that bottom drawer go things stored up for the bridegroom rather than things stored up for the wedding. And in the Song of Songs, even though the the men in the Song of Songs had already many wives. She had no husbands and she had stored everything up for him. Well, I must finish and I conclude with a word for two groups of people who are listening to me. First of all, I want to say a word to the sinners among us and second, I want to say a word to the singles among us. And I believe both words are needed at the end of a talk like this first of all, to the sinners. And if we take Jesus' standard and apply it to ourselves, there are many, many adulterers listening to my voice now. And there's one using it. And President Carter, you remember, remember caused a real stir by his very honest admission in his presidential run-up that he had committed adultery. He had done it in the way that Jesus said, that the thought and the look is the same as the act. So here is an area in which sin really does play havoc and in which we need the forgiveness of God. It's a bigger group than we might imagine. I want to say that these are sins, but they are not the worst sins, and they are not unforgivable sins. I'm afraid many people do believe that sexual sins are the unforgivable ones, but that is wide of the truth. Forget that one. Nor are they the worst sins in the book. Jesus dealt much more harshly with hypocrisy and anger and malice among God's people than he dealt with the woman taken in adultery. But he did deal with the sin in her, and he did deal with it firmly. And I want to say two things about forgiveness that are very important. One, forgiveness is not permission to go on sinning. That's terribly important. If you've got yourself into a wrong situation, forgiveness is not permission to stay in it. Forgiveness is the way out of it. And the second thing about forgiveness, forgiveness does not turn the clock back. It cannot put you where you were. It cannot restore your innocence. It can remove the consequences of your guilt, but it cannot restore your innocence. And someone who has crossed this line can never again be a virgin. They can be a forgiven sinner, but they can't recover their innocence any more than the prodigal son could have the money back that he'd spent in the far country. Having understood this, Jesus died that you might be forgiven and that the fear and the guilt and the shame might be utterly removed. And this thing which had become a barrier not only between you and God, but it quickly becomes a barrier between you and other people. This thing can be taken right away and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I think of two marriages I've conducted some years ago. One, a dear little couple who came to this church 
And both came to know the Lord Jesus on the same night and they asked if they could come and talk to me during the week and, and they came a few days later and they sat there, bless them, and in all innocence they said, this, we've both become Christians now but there's just something that we're worried about. And I said, what is it? And they said, we've been living together for two years and we, we feel as Christians a bit uncomfortable about that now. You know, I found my heart being filled with love towards them. They were just so open and honest about it. And I said to them, well, that's got to be dealt with. How soon could you arrange a wedding? And they said, two months. I said, well, would you stay away from each other for two months if I married you? They said, yes, it's going to be difficult. I said, yes, it will be, and you may have to ring me up when it's getting too difficult. But would you do that? They said, yes. And on the wedding day they came, and it was one of the purest weddings I conducted. I felt totally at ease in that situation. The other wedding was very similar. A very beautiful girl, but she had the honesty not to turn up in a white gown. She'd come to know the Lord. Now they were going to have a fresh start and have a real Christian marriage instead of cohabitation. She wore a beautiful pink or apricot dress. She looked a queen, and the forgiveness that the Lord had given her shone out. Her husband died of cancer just two and a half years ago, but their relationship during that last few months of his life in which they knew that he was going to heaven and shared it fully was a very beautiful thing. But as I say, she was honest enough not to dress in white. She came as she was, a forgiven sinner. To the singles, I want to say this. I am very sorry if the church is conformed to the world in so far as it gives you the impression that to be married is to be first class and to be single is to be second class. If you have picked up the message, even from within Christian fellowship, that marriage is essential to fullness of life, may I say in the name of the Lord, that is wrong. Our society is so geared to marriage, love and sex, that you may feel that you are missing out on real life. Let me tell you that marriage can be a foretaste of heaven and a foretaste of hell on earth and so can being single both states need a special gift of God's grace if they are to be redeemed and all that God wants them to be I feel it's quite out of place to congratulate a married couple wait 25 years and then you'll have something to congratulate fancy congratulating someone who's just starting seems crazy to me but I'd like to congratulate some of you who are single. For you've made a better job of being single than others had of being married. And you are to be congratulated. Indeed, there is a case to be made for this fact that the Old Testament norm is to be married and the New Testament norm is to be single. And if you read the teaching of Jesus, who was single, and the teaching of Paul, who was single, carefully, you'll discover that you have a greater freedom to be totally committed and involved with people and with the Lord. And some of the most effective saints through the ages are those who have been single either by choice, as Henry Martin was when he left his fiancée to go and ultimately die in Persia as a missionary, or of necessity, like Gladys Aylward, who became one of the best-known women missionaries of our century. So I congratulate you. I want to tell you that you're going to have to look for one thing, and that is an equally effective alternative for keeping you humble. <laughs> I'll leave you to think that one through. <laughs> but you single people need something as effective as marriage to keep you humble someone who knows you very well indeed. 
Even in the Old Testament, I noticed that God's will varied. To a Jeremiah, he said, you must remain a bachelor. To Hosea, he said, you must marry a prostitute and demonstrate my love for her. And to an Ezekiel, he said, your wife is going to die and you mustn't even cry. Isn't it amazing how God's will is so varied, even in the Old Testament? But in the New, there is a special place for being single. And I've got news for you. Everybody in heaven will be single. Did you know that? There are no double rooms in glory. <laughs> Some of you husbands and wives are going to get a shock. It has troubled me sometimes when dying people have looked forward to heaven as a kind of being reunited in a double room with their husband or wife. You got married for a period from the wedding till death parts and that is the end of the marriage. And you will not be husband and wife in glory. You will be single again. You will be brother and sister with a lot of other brothers and sisters. Let's state that quite clearly. Jesus was asked a woman had a husband, he died, she married again, he died, she married again, he died, and so on, right through to seven husbands. Then they said, now, what an awful row there's going to be in heaven when she meets up with seven husbands. And Jesus said, you go wrong because you don't know the scriptures. In heaven they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They're like the angels. So when we have our marriage rev review weekends at Ladywell Convent and separate couples and put them in single rooms, we're giving them a little foretaste of heaven. <laughs> The other thing I want to say is this. Not only in heaven will we all be single, but in heaven we'll all be married. And this is where we touch in the very last moments on the statement in Scripture that marriage is a mystery. And I don't mean when you see the couple and say, what on earth does he see in her and what does she see in him? <laughs> Some marriages are that kind of mystery. But real marriage, true love, is a mystery. It points beyond itself. And if you think hard about it, you'll see that it's a beautiful picture of the relationship between God and men. In the Old Testament, God says, I am your husband. You are my bride. And at one time he said to Israel, you're like a teenage bride who's been rejected. So that teenage marriages, even in those days, tended to break down. And then we come to the New Testament and Jesus said, I am, what, the way, the truth, and the life? That's wonderful. The resurrection, living bread, light of the world. I am the bridegroom, the bridegroom, and you are the bride. And Paul says to the Christians he'd led to the Lord, I have betrothed you to Jesus. You are betrothed, every one of you. You're all engaged. Then single people shout hallelujah, I'm going to be married. Be the best marriage there's ever been. When you study Eastern marriages, oh, how it opens your eyes to Jesus. This is what happens in just a few sentences the bridegroom leaves his father's house and goes to where the bride is and he drinks wine with her and then he pays the price for her. Then he goes back to his father's house and for 12 months he prepares a place for her to live while she prepares her clothes. And she doesn't know when he's going to come until one day one day there's a, no a noise, somebody blows a trumpet, somebody shouts, and down the road comes a procession led by the bridegroom. And he comes to take her away from her family and to take her to the place that he's built to live with him forever. And when they get there, the date on which he has come for her and goes back to be married, that date is decided by the bridegroom's father alone. The bridegroom doesn't have a say in the date. And Jesus said, Of that day or of that hour knoweth no man, neither the fa son but the father only. So the father decides the date, and the bridegroom comes to the bride, takes her back, and the marriage is consummated immediately. And as soon as it is, it is announced to the guests, and the bride appears unveiled 
with all the glory and joy of her husband reflected in her face and they then go into a feast that can last seven days or even three weeks. Do you get the message? The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and the angel will be hollering enough noise to wake the dead and we shall meet him in the air. The bride will meet the bridegroom. We don't know the date. The Father sets that date and he's preparing a place for us. Are we preparing our clothes for him? The fine white linen which are the deeds of the saints, the righteous deeds of the saints. That's our job now, to be getting the wedding dress ready. It's going to be a white wedding because the blood of Jesus has washed us whiter than snow. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Every human marriage ought to be in miniature a picture of Jesus and his body, the church. And it can only be that when it's between two Christians. And the last word I'll say is this. A Christian marriage is a marriage between Christians. If you marry a child of the devil, you'll have real problems with your father-in-law. Christian marriage is between two Christians. A Christian man and a Christian woman who accept the social responsibility and their part in the total community, who make a personal commitment to each other that they will stick together through thick and thin, for better, for worse, and who can then consummate, put the finishing touch to that marriage by becoming one flesh. Let's pray. Father, you alone know the thoughts and the feelings that have been going through us while we've listened to this exposition of your word. Thank you that your word is so clear. You don't leave us in ignorance. We don't go wrong through ignorance. Usually we go wrong through disobedience. Forgive us that streak in us that shares Esau's outlook, that is happy to have a plate of soup now rather than a birthright someday in the future. Lord, make us more like Jacob, even with all his scheming. Help us to hold on to you and not to let you go till you bless us. And I pray that if this sermon has aroused any fears or questions or problems in anybody's life, that you'll give them the grace and the courage to go and share that with another Christian and together seek your face and get it put right. And Lord, we ask that the marriages we seek to build within our fellowship may not bore holes in the ship of society, but may be strong bricks to build into our community. Lord, we all have much to be forgiven and much to learn. And we thank you that you begin with us where we are. But we praise you too that you're going to present us faultless before the throne of grace. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.